The public has a long-held fascination with detectives. Detectives see a side of life the average person is never exposed to. In this podcast series, I Catch Killers with Gary Jubelin, I'll be interviewing a whole range of people you come across as a detective, including police, bad guys and victims. I spent 34 years as a cop. For 25 of those years, I was catching killers. That's what I did for a living. I was a homicide detective. I'm no longer just interviewing bad guys. Instead, I'm taking the public into the world in which I operated. The guests I selected have amazing stories from all sides of the law. The interviews are raw and honest, just like the world they inhabited. No one who steps into the world of crime comes out unchanged. Join me now while I take you into this world. This episode of I Catch Killers contains conversations that some listeners may find confronting or triggering. Discretion is advised. Welcome back to part two of Bernie Matthews on I Catch Killers. I hope you enjoyed part one as much as I did. Bernie's a man of many talents, a former armed robber, long-term prisoner, escapee, poet, writer and award-winning journalist. In part one, Bernie was telling us about his career, for want of a better word, as an armed robber. That's what he did for a living, he robbed banks. He got caught for his crimes and sent to prison, but managed to escape from Long Bay Prison and was on the run, during which time he went back to his career and started robbing banks again. But Bernie's career on the run came to a crashing end and he found himself back inside prison. Get ready for part two. There is a rawness and honesty to the way Bernie tells his story. I've sat opposite enough bad guys to know when I'm being played. That is not the case with Bernie. He's just telling it the way it is. Again, a listener warning is advised. Today's content will be heavy and confronting. Let's get back to part two of Bernie Matthews on I Catch Killers. We're now going to take the uh, this podcast into another area where uh, the Bernie's incarceration, and this is a time when he uh, got to experience... Uh, hard time, and I think that's a fair way of describing it, Bernie, yeah. um, at, uh, at Grafton. But before I do, I want to read something out, and this was at the start of uh, Bernie's book, and it's called, uh, Bernie's uh, book, by the way, is Intractable. It was written in 2000, 2006. 2006. If you can get your hands on it, you should uh, should try, because it gives a really uh, deep insight into uh, life on life on the inside. I think it's only available on, in ebook now, because the print run's expired. Okay. Unless they do it, unless... Unless Pam McMillan do another print run, yeah, but it is available on on, on ebook. Okay, I, I have seen it round before mm. uh, before I, I got this copy, but uh, yeah, it certainly uh, if you're interested in what we're covering here, it certainly goes into some detail. But what I want to read out is uh, something that was at the start of the book, and it's a uh, it's a quote from a uh, US, U.S. District Court Judge Dennis Challen. Um, it was reported in uh, 1994, but it's very relevant for what we're going to talk about this next uh, part of the uh, the podcast. So I'll just read it out. And this is a quote from, from the judge, talking about uh, prisoners and uh, incarceration. We want them to have self-worth, so we destroy their self-worth. We want them to be responsible, so we take away all responsibilities. We want them to be part of our community, so we isolate them from our community. We want them to be positive and constructive, so we degrade them and make them useless. We want them to be non-violent, so we put them where violence is all around. We want them to be kind and loving, so we subject them to hatred and cruelty. We want them to quit being the tough guy, so we put them where the tough guy is respected. We want them to quit hanging around with losers, so we put all the losers under one roof. We want them to quit exploiting us, so we put them where they exploit each other. We want them to take control of their own lives, own their problems and quit being parasites so we make them totally dependent on us. That's a quote and uh, when I read it, it sort of really resonated with me after reading your your story and understanding your story. Um, And I think it's a judge saying how long, how wrong, and bearing in mind this, I I hope it's progressed since then, but how wrong the prison system was back in those days. Mm. Well, the judge wrote that in the 90s uh, I did most of my hard time in the 70s. Mm. And uh, for a judge to be so perceptive, it, it, it was unbelievable. I've never, I've never heard uh, of any other judge describe the system the way he did. Yeah. It was just incredible. It, it nailed some points, didn't it? It, yeah, it really it nailed some did, points yeah. that uh, certainly uh, came, came out in your book. But let's take it back uh, to where we were when we uh, finished part one. Uh, we had you been arrested uh you'd been on the run how long were you on the run for roughly two months maybe a little bit longer okay and uh you'd been arrested what happened from there 
Well, then from there, I went back to Parramatta Jail. And as I said, uh, I continued to try to escape, but I was kept in the circle, which is a, a jail within a jail. So the attempts be, became more desperate because uh, you had to escape from the, fr- from the circle to get into the main jail to escape from the main jail. So um, it was a system of... of, of and you, uh, you, had your, you had your hacksaw blade attempt and cutting yeah, through the prison van. That, that, that didn't work. Yeah. So you're still at Parramatta? Yeah, still at Parramatta. Uh, anyway, as I said, the uh, escape attempts, you know, they, they gradually grew more and more desperate. And in December 1971, it culminated with uh, another prisoner and I. Uh, I made a a grappling hook and 18 foot of uh, rope in in, in a chute. He was in the yard next door to me. And uh, we'd plotted to assault the the screw that was open in the yard because if you wanted to go to the toilet or the shower, they had to let you out of the yard and take you over the shower yard. On top of the circle, you had like a a catwalk with a screw up there, but he wasn't armed. All the... the screws that were armed on the guard towers on the walls and what the game plan was was to to get out of the circle and go through the roof which had wire netting on it in those days and then get down near the laundry throw the grappling hook over the over the wall near the laundry and get over there and, and then away that was the game plan anyway uh, what happened is call the screw over to open up the, the gate uh, Mick hit him over the head with a yard broom. I attacked him, grabbed the keys, tried to unlock Mick's yard, and all the keys fell on the floor and they all got jangled up. The screw in the in the tower sounded the alarm, and then it was all over by the shouting. Screws came from everywhere. Uh, they overpowered us. Oh, there was you know there was a a fight on, but uh, they overpowered us. Got knocked out, dragged into cells. And uh, as far as the screws were concerned, it was a definite attempt on the lives of the screws in the, that were in the maximum security section. They, uh, they brought two visit and justice in, in that afternoon. They gave us both 28 days solitary and took us back to the cells. At six o'clock the next morning, a uh, two-car convoy picked us up and took us to Grafton. Right. And uh, that was like the beginning of the end. Uh, the trip up the graft, and as I said, it was a two-car convoy. We didn't get fed. We didn't get water. There was no toilet breaks. You know, we just, you know, we were, <laughs> I guess, you know, we, we, we were just nothing as far as they were concerned. Their job was just to, to deliver us up there and and uh, get us our punishment. And and from corrective services to just get the mindset of, and I'm not talking individuals here, but I'm talking the organisation. Mm. Uh, You've um, you've escaped, um, and you've also um, attacked um, prison officers, mm. and uh, they, as you said, you um, they indicated it was an attempt on the prisoners' uh, officers' life. That's right. Um, you're considered a violent person, so there's no love between the uh, between no. you or the uh, the or corrective the services. Mm. Yeah. Well, you see, back in those days, there were five cardinal rules, and the five cardinal rules were. You don't kill a prison guard, you don't assault a prison guard, you don't escape, you don't attempt to escape, and you don't participate in a riot. If you break one of those cardinal rules, and I'd, I'd break on about four of them already, yeah. if you break any one of those cardinal rules, that earns you a trip to Her Majesty's Jail Grafton, the intractable section of Grafton Jail. And Grafton had a reputation, and the reputation was brutality that when, when you went there, they were going to knock it all out of you. And that was the whole game plan. And uh, and that was known within the system? That was known. Pri- All your prisoners knew oh, that, yeah. that this like, is the last, last yeah, stop? That's, yeah, that's the last stop. Yeah. The, 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 definitely the last stop. Yeah. You know, that's it. You, you know, you, you're on a one-way ticket. And, uh, yeah, when you get there, they... Uh, well, I, I'd spoken to blokes that came back from Grafton and, and I heard all the stories the same as I heard all the stories about Tamworth Boys Home um, and blokes don't lie you know like when they come back from Grafton you, you know, like people like to think crims you know, they talk bullshit all day no, that's not right you know, when people come back from places like that they tell you stories but the stories are so atrocious that John Citizen just couldn't believe it yeah and that's it. And yet, to us, it was a way of life. You know, it was a, 
an accepted way of life. Mm. You know, they, they, that's what you're going to face, and and you know, just just you know, be prepared for it. Um, what I what I knew about Grafton prior to going up there is whatever you do, whatever you do, don't make a sound, don't yell out, don't give them the satisfaction of knowing that they're hurting you. Don't whatever you do, don't yell out. And, and that was in the back of my head because if you yell out, of course, the other crims are going to. Yeah, you know, have a go at you and say, "Well, you know, you're weak. You, weak. Know, you couldn't handle the flogging." Um, so that was the main thought in the back of my head. Now I, I didn't know what to expect. No one knows what to expect. You know, you know like they hear of floggings, you hear of bashings, you hear of batting weapons, but you don't really know what to expect until it's inflicted on you. Yeah, then you know what it's all about. So we get to we got the graft about oh, about half past four, four o'clock that day, and. Uh, they dragged us through, the, the screws came out, dragged us through the front gate and uh, dragged us into A-Wing. And the first screw said to me, what's your name? I said, Matthews. And he get a smack in the mouth. He said, Matthews. He said, you say, sir. You, officer asked you, and you say, sir. So I learnt, okay, you say, sir. So I said, all right. No, I looked at him. Bang, I copped it again. Don't look at an officer. So I knew I, two lessons. Say, sir, and don't look at him. I looked at the floor, and I got a couple other kicks, you know, reefs in the guts and smacks in the mouth. And then uh, they dragged me up to uh, a little alcove off A-Wing, and uh, there was a yard. And they dragged me into the yard. There's about five screws. And I said, right, I strip off. I stripped off. Open your mouth. Open your mouth. Bend over, spread the cheeks of your ass. Bent over, spread the cheeks, and then it happened. Then it happened. You know, it, it just exploded all down my back, and and it was it was the shock of it. You know, it was the complete shock. You know, like I'm nude, totally nude, and they they just give it to me with these batons all from my neck down to me down to my knees, and uh, yeah, there was a couple of kicks, punches, and that. But I tried to smother up. I went into a, a ball, and. Uh, yeah, they uh, somewhere along the line they they knocked me unconscious. I was I went out to it and they dragged me into a cell, and that was a pound cell, a solitary confinement cell. Anyway, they slammed the door shut. And then he opened it up. He said, "Whenever I open this door, you face the back wall, bastard." And that was the other thing that you know they said, "Bastard, cunt." Yeah, that and mm. in the end you think, well, that's my name now. That's my new name, you know. And they never called you by the name. They called you by some 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 swear word, you know. Anyway, I uh, said so you got to be facing the back wall whenever the doors are. Yes, sir. And, um, they threw some clothes and I got dressed, and uh, I was facing the back wall, and the door opened, and uh, they threw the clothes in, and that was it. So I tried to to lie down. There, there wasn't. A part of my body where I could lie, you know, everything was covered in bruises. I don't know how long the flogging lasted. It, it, it felt like hours. Maybe it was five minutes, ten minutes. I don't know. Yeah, mm. time was irrelevant. And um, it was a piece to get knocked unconscious. Oh yeah, yeah. Because it was all over. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I knew I had blood all over me. I, you know, I know it came from my mouth and my nose. I knew that. Mm. And I had lumps and bruises everywhere. I knew that because I couldn't lay anywhere. You know, I'd lay on my side and it would be sore. I'd lay on my back, couldn't lay on my back. Lay on my guts, couldn't lay on my guts. So you, you, you're sort of moving around there all night trying to find a spot that's not sore. Mm. Anyway, the next morning, uh, they opened up the door, so I ran to the back wall, faced the back wall, about turned, bastard. Come here and get your breakfast. I go out, bend down, pick up the breakfast. Don't look at the screw. Just keep looking at the floor and go to the back wall. Anyway... I shut the door and I sat down and I start spooning the breakfast. It was oatmeal mush. Anyway, I get a spoonful of it and something starts wriggling on it. And I looked at it and it was a maggot. <laughs> Fuck this, I'm not eating that shit. So I put the spoon back in it and I waited for him to come and collect the Dixies. So I opened up the door, faced the back wall, about turn, bring your Dixie out here. And the Dixie was near the door, put it outside. And I shut the door. I ran back to the back wall till they'd gone. And then they opened up the door again, so I went to the back wall again. I said, about turn. He come here, bastard. And I went to the door. He said, do you want a fucking hunger strike? I said, no, sir. He said, well, eat your fucking breakfast. 
I'll be back. I want to see the plate empty. And slam the door. So, you know. I had to weigh up, what do I do? Do I eat this shit or do I cop another flogging? I took the loose line of resistance and ate it. So for the next 28 days, I ate that shit. Never again. <laughs> I've never touched porridge again. I don't blame you. Never I don't again. blame you. But, you know, that was just so, one, one thing that... Yeah, resonating in, well, in your mind. It, it, it spelled me on just listening to it, and it, it's almost like you're reliving it, uh, yeah. talking about it. And then I would imagine an experience like that is not going to uh, leave your psyche. It's going to hang hang around. Oh, it's hung there. Yeah. 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 So that was your treatment that way. And I, I just want to clarify that there, there was an inquiry about Grafton and, oh, that, and that. was years so, later. But yeah. this, so what you're talking about is stuff that's it's public you know, record. It's pub, public oh, yeah. record. Oh yeah. So. The way that you were treated, was that because of your reputation and, and you've broken the one of, well, four of the cardinal uh, rules? Is... No, well, you, you could look at it that way, but yeah. I don't because yeah. I've seen other blokes grow up there and they've copped the same, if not worse, if not less. Yeah. So I put it down to that was just the system. Mm. Everyone got treated the, exactly the same way, M- maybe to different degrees. They all cop and the you same. were called intractables there, and that was yeah. a, a well. I'd say you could wear it with courage or or whatever, but it, it was basically um, how you were defined by corrective services right, that uh, you couldn't be controlled. No, uncontrollable. And that's why Grafton was set up that that way. Although well, that was a theory. I looked at the history of Grafton, and, and apparently it opened in 1943 because a, a guy stabbed a, a prison guard at Maitland Jail. And the screws went on strike. Said, "Look, you know, we've got to have someone to protect us. We've got to have a jail for these blokes, you know, these violent offenders." And they decided to set Grafton Jail as the place yeah. to send incorrigible or, or recalcitrant or intractable prisoners. Now, to to perpetrate the 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 violence or, or, or the rehabilitation by the baton and the boot, what they did. <laughs> is they paid the screws to go there and they offered them a climatic allowance. Now, the climatic allowance was an increase in their pay to go there and flog us. Yeah. But they called, they termed it a, a, a climatic allowance. And, you know, w- w- when you look at it you, and you think to yourself, well, yeah, there's no way around this. You know, the system's got it all sewn up. Yeah. They can do whatever they want. And, uh, yeah, it's... Um, yeah, it makes you think, and yeah, it, 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 there's just no answer to it. Yeah, you know, that's the way it was. So that that was your that was your introduction to Grafton. Yeah. How long did you end up spending at Grafton? Right, I uh, I did the twenty eight days pound. I got flogged by every screw there, with the exception of one. There was only one screw in the whole place that never flogged a crim, which is really really weird. His name was Collins, and uh, he refused point blank. He refused. Uh, the other screws to go in on the floggers just refused yeah. point blank yeah. and you know I don't know what it was but but to me he was the only screw that showed any sort of moral sense of uh, of, of any yeah, kind you know t- taking a stand yeah he, he, and it, it surprised me but then again you know it, you know, I've been flogged and when I say flogged I, I mean batten whipped and, and, and kicked and yeah you can describe it blow by blow but it, it serves no useful purpose yeah, yeah. but what did really resound with me was I remember one night they just came in and they flogged the whole shop. Now the whole shop was a was a yard and there was five of us to a yard, and they flogged us. I forget what the reason was. Some some trivial reason. They they didn't need a reason to flog us. And uh, I went to the door when they shut the door and they were standing outside the door, and the footballer he was he was a really savage screw. And he was talking to another screw and he said, oh, yeah, well, listen, uh, my daughter's going here. She's playing tennis this weekend. And, and I'm thinking to myself, he's just come in and flogged the shitty out of me. And he's out there talking about things that are so mundane like it's an everyday occurrence. Yeah, it's it a, just blew me mind, you know, that they could switch like that. They, they, it's, uh, there's a disconnect there. That's, yeah, uh, it was unbelievable. A bit scary. Yeah. But you you can go from that to, uh, yeah. yeah. The mundane stuff. Yeah, and you know, I just put it down to, uh, especially at the Royal Commission, they all offered the Eichmann defence, and the Eichmann defence was I didn't, I didn't. Well, Eichmann said I didn't drop a cyclone B gas canister into any of the 
in the, any of the gas chambers. I just signed the orders. This, this is uh, you're talking the trial from war crimes. Yeah, yeah, and, and, the, and they all they all pleaded the Eichmann defence. Oh, I was only following orders. Yeah, and they all got rewarded. They all got promoted, or they got pensioned off, and, they, and that that was the system. How did you make a life for yourself in that uh, in that type of environment? Tried to keep the mind occupied. I guess that was the thing. Tried to keep the mind occupied. If you can, if you can keep your mind active, if you can keep your mind occupied, if you can keep your mind above everything, uh, that's half the battle. Could you associate with other prisoners? Yeah, up in the yard. And and who were some of the prisoners that you associated with up there, or that you came into contact with? Oh, what names? Yeah, yeah, like ah, oh, Thornton. Uh, his brother was doing life for murder. Yeah. Freddie Harbeck, he was an ex-French Foreign Legionnaire doing life for murder. McCafferty, he yep. was a thrill killer. Um, he, the list goes on and on and on. It's just, it's just a never-ending list. Yeah. But um, I, I, I guess, I guess it was the tension. You know, you, 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 you've got this. Tense, you, you, your guts are not of tension the whole time you're there. I say, uh, well, I see in your book you you talk about the you didn't mind the flogging, but it was or well, when they say you didn't mind the flogging, that's cheapening it. Of yeah, course, I you didn't want a flogging, but mm. you can deal with a flogging. But it's not; uh, it's about waiting yeah. when you when you're going you to be flogged. Don't know what flogged. to expect. So you could never really relax and go, yeah. okay, well, I've got a couple of days to chill out. Or the only time you got to relax is when they slammed that door shut of a night. Yeah. Then you knew for at least eight hours they weren't going to flog her. Yeah. Yeah. They opened the door the next one. Like, for example, and I remember this is bright, uh, uh, just as clear as a bell. One time they had what they call as a fallout. Now, a fallout was a random strip search. That's yeah. the easiest way to explain yep. it. And you got five men to a workshop and you'd have a, a prison guard per man, sometimes two per man. So you line up the mask down the workshop, and then they say fall out. Well, you've got to fall out. You, you've got to strip off all your clothes, put your clothes in front of you, and stand there in the nude while they search your clothes yep. and search you. So we had a fall out this day, and Apps was on the end of the line. He was up the other end. I was about the third in line. And he was stripped off. Then all of a sudden, they've attacked Apps. They've batten whipped him. They just flogged him. They flogged him unconscious. They've got blood flowing everywhere. Anyway... I, you weren't allowed to look. You couldn't look, but mm. you could look out the corner of your eye. You, you could slice slew. You had to be looking at the ground, but you could see out the corner of your eye. You couldn't see everything, but you could get a gist of what was going on. Anyway, they flogged him. They just they just unmercifully flogged him. Anyway, they dragged him into the into the pound yard, and that's it. We don't know what happened. Well, we all got dressed, and we went down to the yard, marched down to the yard, and I said to one of the blokes, what happened to Abs? He said they found contraband on him. Oh, fuck. And now contraband in those days was you had a handkerchief and a comb. That's all you were allowed in your pocket. In Grafton. Yeah. yeah. That's all you were allowed. Yeah. Anything apart from a handkerchief and a comb was classed as contraband. Apps had two cigarette butts in his top pocket. That's what he got flogged unconscious for. That was the contraband. I never ever forgot that. Yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, that's pretty savage uh, punishment, yeah. uh, punishment for that. Yeah, so, you know, it's not, it's not just what happened to me. I watch what happened to people around me. With um, communication between the cells, were you yeah. one out in the cells at Grafton? Yeah, always one out. How did you communicate? The Grafton Could, knock. Yeah, talk us about the Grafton knock. I think people would be fascinated by well, that. It's, it's like a, it's like, it's like a, a Morse code, but the easiest way to remember it, or the easiest way I was taught, was all, all, all good moles stay young. A-G-M-S-Y. That's the first letter of the line. Right. Then it goes long for six letters. So the first knock is the line knock. So if I want Gary, I go knock, uh, knock, no, yeah, knock, then knock is A, then R is uh, RS, RST, S, you go uh, M, M, N, O, P, Q, R, 6. So you've got Gary, R, and then the Y. Yeah. So it's like a Morse code, but it's like a very intricate. It was a very intricate code, and they, they, no one could break it. 
Yeah. It was just an unbreakable code. And so that was knocking between the cells. Yeah. Like you, you could communicate with someone. You'll find most grafting tracks, they used to have calluses on that knuckle <laughs> yeah, from, from knocking. Because that was the only way of communication. RSI from typing. Yeah. Basically. Yeah, same um, thing. So that was, that was it. It yeah. was... Yeah. And you'd be, that's how you communicate. Yeah, and, and like like I remember when I first went up there, uh, uh, someone knocked through and I, I knocked back, who are you? He said, Ned. That was Neddy Smith. Right, yeah. okay. He was, in, he was in the next cell. Um, yeah, it, it was just one of those things that you learn. If you, if you couldn't read or write, well, you had big problems. There were a lot of blokes that went up there that couldn't read and write, oh, but sure. there was a lot of blokes that could. Okay. And, that was the main method of communication, the graft and knock. What was it? There was another way you communicated, talking through, through the, the toilets. Through, where, the, where, through the telephone. Where, where, <laughs> what was that? Is that grafting or paramount? No, that was, well, when they put the sewage pipes in, yeah. it became everywhere. Yeah. And a lot of blokes don't know about it, especially in these, this modern day and yeah. age. Like I remember I was, at the, I was at the bay in 2010 and uh, I said to a bloke, he was a Lebanese bloke, he wasn't a bad bloke, I said, listen, I'll get on the phone tonight and I'll, I'll have a talk to you. Well, of course, he was in he was in the cell with a, a well-known drug dealer who was uh, I think he was Russian or Croatian, a big bloke. Anyway, he goes to the cell and he flushes out the, the water in the bottom of the bowl. Well, I've done the same on my side. Well, when you flush the water out, you can do the same thing in the block of flats. You flush the water out, and you can speak through the pipe because the pipes are hollow, and you can speak to the one upstairs or the one alongside. And that was the telephone system. Well, of course. This bloke had done that, and, and, and the, the Croatian bloke, he was looking at him. He said, what are you doing? You know, he's speaking a yeah. Croatian. He said, what the fuck are you doing? He said, I'm getting on the phone to Bernie. <laughs> what do you mean a fucking phone? What, what fucking phone? Anyway, he got down. He said, the bullshit. And he heard my voice from the other end. Yeah. He said, fucking the bullshit. And this was 2010. They, these guys had never heard of it. And yet, that was our line of communication back in the seventies. That was the old school pre <laughs> pre mobile phone days. <laughs> uh, I, I can imagine it wasn't very pleasant sometimes. But, no, uh, uh, well, especially up there because you had to put a pillow on a blanket over your head because if the screws heard you talking on the phone, that was that was an automatic flogging. And that's what it was known as the phone. Yeah, the yeah, phone. Yeah, telephone. Okay. Yeah, the cologne. <laughs> Classic, classic. So, with the, the, was there violence amongst the prisoners? Was yeah. there, a, 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 like the prisoners would yeah. turn on themselves, even though yeah. they had the arch enemies, yeah. the, the screws. Yeah. There was still, it was still a yeah, tough because fun. of the tension. No, right. no other reason. Like I, I uh, in the in the sewing yard, you had a, a a set of scissors, a pair of scissors, but the scissors were rounded, so you couldn't stab anyone. Yep. And uh, you had to sew the shirts. We were sewing sewing shirts, and and you had to sew the shirts so many so many to an inch and the shirts were sent back to other jails for prison uniform yep. anyway we're so on there one day and i got into an argument with apps and apps said oh you're sewing the button on wrong <laughs> yeah well i've jumped up with a scissor you fucking prick i'll fucking stab you in the throat i was all over a button over a, a button. rotten poxy button yeah two, two tough guys yeah. how you sew a button yeah. on yeah it, it was just craziness you know we calmed down he said oh, look yeah, you know, we can't, you know, can't carry it on because the screws are running floggers and all the rest, and you know we would have got battered senseless. But I, I always remember that too because uh, it was not in me character. I just flipped like that, you know, just 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 flipped and wanted to attack, just just attack. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah and, I, and that's you said very early when we were first talking about the the pressure mm, cooker, the you know, just yeah. ready to explode. Yeah. And is that be, you think that's part and parcel of oh, the is. violence that's inflicted on you? Yes. I, 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 because you can't, you, well, you I'm can't sure, do anything. But you can't retaliate no. to the uh, screws no. because it was going to uh, uh, double back at you. Worse than that. Yeah. They'd, near, they'd bury you. Yeah. Like, don't get me wrong, there are blokes that have, that have fought back. But, but when you hear what happened to them, you, know, you think, well, that's not a viable proposition. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, this first stint you did at Grafton, how long were you up there for? No, December till... Well, I came back in 1972 to front court. Uh, that would have been about six months, I guess. And then I fronted court, but then I, I tried a couple more escapes when I came back, so that sort of created more problems for myself. Um... How, how did you get out of Grafton? Like, in the end? Yeah. 
1975. No, but sorry, that that first time when you said you came back, so you went, I went back, back to, to Parramatta Circle. Right. Okay. Yeah, I yep. was always kept in segregation, always kept in high security. Yep. Um, then I fronted court on the uh, on the armed robberies I'd committed. Uh, then in 1973, my mother died when I was doing I was doing solitary again, and. Uh, the judge refused to sentence me until I went to the funeral. They weren't going to take me to the funeral. Yeah. And uh, he ordered that they take me to the funeral. So I was taken to the grave. And um, the next day, I just threw my hands up in the air and said, oh, do what you want. Pretty good. Yeah. I, uh, I got 18 years uh, all up. Well, I got about 90 years all up, but a lot of it was concurrent. In reality, I got 18 years with an eight-year non-parole period. In other words, Judge Leslie said, well, you know, basically, if you behave yourself for eight years, yeah, you're, you know, you're a chance to, to get out. And that was 1973, so I still had five years to go. But that didn't really register with me. I just, you know, I just had a gutful. Yeah. So they sent me back in September 73 to Grafton for the third time. Yep. And on the reception... What, what were you sent back there for? Attempted escape. Right, what, more more attempted escapes when when I was in the circle. Right, at, another at attempted Parramatta. escape. Yeah, yeah. And uh, when I went back the third time, I got the reception biff, and they, they dislodged the disc in my spine. Oh, they did something to the disc in my spine. I don't know what yeah. they did. Um, the the prison doctor up there, he was a, he was a dud. He was a, he was a disgrace to his profession. But uh, like blokes had come before him covered in bruises and you know. He just ignored them until the bruises healed and he'd examine them, you know? Yeah. Uh, I complained about the disc and he eventually, after a couple of months, he sent me over to Grafton Base Hospital for an X-ray and I don't know what happened, you know? He mm. didn't tell me anything. But I knew they'd damaged it, but I, I couldn't work out what they'd done. Those um, those times you, you went between um, Grafton and back to Parramatta and yeah. that, there's one um, uh, part in your book, and I, I'm, I'm going to read it out. Yeah. It, it, it's, a, it's a quote, but it talks about the, you know, you, we were talking about the, the pressure keg and how mm. violent you became. That um, back at um, uh, Parramatta Jail, I think this occurred, and this, this is a quote from uh, yourself, and I, I want to talk about it because it just, I think it expresses that anger that we talk, we're talking of. The full force of my fist buried itself in his face. It felt good. He staggered and I leapt on him, burying my teeth into uh, his throat screw. Yeah. before his mate had a chance to jump in. Mm. I could feel the warm blood pulsing out of the punctured holes I'd made with my teeth as I tried to gnaw out his jugular vein. Mm. He writhed underneath me, screaming in terror. In that moment, he was every motherfucking screw who had ever bashed me. That's right. Bernie, that's really um, heavy stuff. You, you, you're describing in, in in your own words trying to bite someone's throat yeah. out. That's... Yeah. Well, I had no other weapons. You know, I only had myself. You know, talk talk me through the mindset there, and talk me through that incident. Yeah, what had happened is they were trying to set me up. The screws, like like the, you, you got to understand, the screws of Parramatta they were dirty on me. Because I'd attack their, you know, as far as I were concerned, I was a ringleader, and I'd attack their, I'd attack their screws during the escape attempt with, with Mick. And these two had come to the door, and and they goaded me, and, and the first screw had gone up front, you know, oh, tough guy, this, that, one thing, the other. But the other one was edging around the back, waiting for me to do something. Well, I've Jerry. Oh God, fuck you! And you know, that was it. I just, just, just attacked. Yeah. Like an attack dog, just just attack. Went went for anything, you know. And uh, yeah, I'm not proud of it, but that's the way it was. Yeah, that's the way it was. And um, yeah, it's extreme. What what was the what was the punishment from that? Oh, I got a bit of a serve up and thrown in the cell, but after a while, the serves just had no effect. Did you become numb to it, or conditioned to it, or just mentally? conditioned would be yeah. a better word. Not you're never numb to it, right? But condition, yeah, because you go, okay, all right, you're gonna get it, okay, just go into smother, Been smother there, yourself, that. yeah, 
Yeah. Mm. There was another time that you went um, uh, down from Grafton, and like to get from to get out of Grafton was a, a, a big goal. It yeah. was an achievement to get away from Grafton and down the Parramatta because mm. life as bad as it is in Parramatta was better than Grafton. It was better than Grafton, that's right. Um, but you saw someone that uh, had uh, dogged on you, and yeah. uh, like you, you were, and I, I found it interesting because you were saying in your book how relieved you felt to finally be out of Grafton. Here I am, I, I now I can almost try to become a human being in yeah. Parramatta. Yeah, that and was at Goulburn. Yeah. It was at Goulburn, was yeah. it? And you, you saw someone that uh, had uh, he'd done. He gave me up on the payroll. Right, mm. and uh, you just went for him. Yeah. Well, uh, see, I've always had a thing about informers. You know, it's just they're anathema to me, and and um, yeah, I guess you know, in these days it's, just, it's part and parcel of the system. But back then, it wasn't. Yeah, you know, you you you, you didn't tell on people. Anyway, you cut a long story short, I I attacked him, and yeah, I, I gave him hell. And uh, yeah, he but ended that, up. Yeah, sorry, he ended up on protection. Ended yeah. up at a farm. Yeah. <laughs> I ended up back in the tracks. <laughs> so you went back to Grafton? <laughs> no, no, I went back to the bay. Right. The governor didn't want me in his jail. Right. You know, I was too hard to handle, so he sent me back to the bay. Yeah. And at the bay, I was in the front yards with, with a guy, and I was in the track. Well, front yards was was where they yeah. housed the tracks at the bay. And uh, he wasn't a bad bloke, John, and we were talking away there. I said, oh, I've had this shit. I want to get out. So I made an application to, to McGeek, and then McGeek was the commissioner. Mm. I said, look, you've had your piece of meat out of me, yeah. you know, like since 1970, you know, and this was 1975. I said, for five years, you know, how about give me a chance let me out back into the mainstream, mainstream yeah. population. Anyway, I wasn't expecting any result. Well, I've got a result. And they said, yeah, all right, you're going back in the mainstream on the Monday. Well, I'd been in jail six years, and I didn't even know how to muster properly. I'd been in the tracks the whole time. Yeah. So the normal discipline in jail, that was a whole new ball game to me, you know? Yes. So I get out, and I said to John, oh, mate, look, I'll look after And they moved me up along the uh, up along the uh, the walkway to, to a, a mainstream cell. Anyway, um, I'm in the cell. Uh, I get a job as, as a sweeper. So everything's rosy, you know. I've got first day out, and I'm looking around the jail, and you know, geez, this is a whole new world. And it was the jail that that I'd escaped from in 1970. You know? yeah. So, uh, you know, it was a, as I said, it was a whole new world. I'm looking those, those little freedoms must have yeah. been so much. Yeah, it was a big there. thing. Yeah, it was a big thing. It was like getting out of jail. Yeah. You know? Anyway, it all came to a crashing end that night. I'm uh, <laughs> I'm in the cell, and they do a cell ramp. And it was a Scottish screw. And he came in, I'm facing the back wall. And uh, I hear this rustling. And I looked over my shoulder, and he's going through me letters. I read me letters, me mail. Yeah. So I've snatched him. He said, you're not reading my fucking mail. It's already been censored. Well, of course, in his Scotch he said, face the fucking wall, face the fucking wall. You get fucked. Well, one thing led to another. I grabbed the shit brush and attacked him, and <laughs> I'm on the way back to Grafton. <laughs> Do you, in those moments, like yeah. sitting there, and uh, yeah, you, the, you're obviously a smart man. Yeah. Um, well, you not s- that smart. Oh well, okay. <laughs> now you're a smart man. Yeah. Perhaps not uh, not, not smart, not ben, smart yeah. then. But did you reflect and go, Bernie, what the fuck have I done? Yeah. Do you did you like go? Yeah. Why can't you just yeah? Yeah, but but it wasn't until years later I became very authoritarian. You got to remember, my first sentence was ten with a four. Yeah, Ten yeah. years with a four, I could have been out within four. Yeah. In, in the end, I got 18 with an eight and done 11. And of the 11, I'd done nine in the tracks. Yeah. <laughs> Real smart. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll take that back. Maybe not Maybe, maybe not that smart. No. But, yeah, I, I wondered, now you look back, but I suppose at the time you're just reacting to who you are and the yeah. environment that you're yeah. in. You're just and, reacting. That's and you're, it, you're not thinking, at that moment, you wanted to belt that screw yeah. and uh, that's what you were going to do. Well, well, at that moment, my... my, my my thing was, my mail's been censored. I'm not going to have everyone read my mail. Yeah, yeah. I don't care who you are. You're not reading me mail. Yeah. That was it. That was the deadline. Yeah. And, you know, I took it to the nth degree. And, of course, you can't have sold a screw. Yeah. So, back to Grafton? Yeah, but, oh, well, no, what happened then? I, they had me in the front yard for a couple of weeks. Then Russell and Mottrick and that escaped. I was in the front yard when all that went down. And then... Uh, they got shot. They were dragged into the ABS, and Stan Emanuel was the head sweeper. This uh, Russell Cox, yeah, Russell, and, Russell, and Mark Motrick and uh, McDougal. 
Uh, and hijacked the, uh, 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 talk, talk us through this uh, escape. Yeah, that was about August 75. They hijacked the, a, a... At Long a, Bay. Yeah, yeah, they hijacked a, 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 a bread truck and they got a screw and they draped him across the, the windscreen. They had a shootout. They had guns and they got guns from the uh, from the armoury. And the truck was driving down the down the road. And just on that, and sorry, draping the, the screw across the windscreen, that yeah. was so the other screws couldn't shoot? Yeah, couldn't shoot them. Okay, so yeah. it was almost like a human shield. Yeah. Okay, yeah. sorry, go on. Now, I didn't see that. I only heard yeah. about that. But what I, did, what I did know is that the truck drove past the CIP where I was, the Central Industrial Prison, and there was a, a, a bread van in between gates. Well, the bread van drove out and rammed the truck that they were in. Yep. So that created a gunfight from the towers and and I was in the front yards and I could see the screws shooting down onto the road so I knew something was yeah. happening but I didn't know who who was who anyway Stan Emanuel was the was the OBS sweeper and uh, Stan was an SKP himself or he told me what had happened they Cox had been shot and I think Motrick was shot and the screw was shot now they rushed the screw to Prince Henry Hospital but Motrick and Cox they put him in the OBS, right, and just left them there to die. Anyway, I said, mate, I said, fuck, you know, something's got to be done. Anyway, he told everyone in the jail, listen, this is fucking what's happening in there. They're leaving them in there to die. Well, of course, the the crims arced, arced up, cut, you know, it's just to keep it on on an even keel. Um, I think it was a nurse, a nurse and a doctor were finally called in yeah. to, to see them, and then they said they've got to go to Prince Henry. They're in bad shape too. So that's how they got to the hospital. Right. Otherwise, they would have been left there overnight and were probably dead the next morning. Okay. So I was there when that happened, and then it was just after about September, I went back to Grafton. And, um, yeah, that was my fourth trip. Well, when I got up there this time, I got the reception, but... It was so ineffectual, it wasn't funny. It was as though the screws had given up hope with me. They're going... Right, that's interesting. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a waste of time. Yeah. You know, like he's been here four times. We're not going to do anything with this bloke. You can flog him till the cows come out. Either he's too thick to learn, yeah. or he just doesn't give a shit. Mm. And uh, I guess doesn't give a shit actually summed it all up. Anyway, uh, I went back. Uh, I was in the braille yard. I was doing braille, and that—that's where you, you're actually. Um, that's part of your employment in there, doing yeah. braille. Like well, the, I was mainly making sewing books. shirts. Yeah. Three shop, one, two, and four shop were sewing shirts. Braille, uh, three shop was the braille shop. Okay, so, uh, converting books to braille. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and it was good because it gave you something, and and, and you learnt something. I was in there with a good crew. You know? Yeah, and uh, yeah. Anyway, in. Uh, November 1975, they, uh, there was rumblings of a royal commission into the whole New South Wales prison system. It started with the Bathurst riot, but they feared that it might go through the system. Well, of course, the head office were, were scared that what was happening at Grafton would come under the spotlight. So they came up with this bright idea. They'd opened up Australia's first supermax prison, and they called it Katingle. And what they'd intended to do was transfer all the hardcore tracks from Grafton into Katingle. So by the time the Royal Commission came around, they could honestly say, well, we, we don't hold intractable prisoners up here anymore. They're all in Katingle. Right. Now, to justify Katingle, what they did is they got the media in and they played the media, which is, and that's that's how it works these days, it still works these yeah. days. Uh, they said Katingle is for terrorists. Now, here we're talking about 1975. The only terrorists that were floating around then was the Red Army and the Bader Minoff gang in Germany. We had no terrorists here in Australia. Yeah. Anyway, that was the game plan. Look, there's terrorists overseas. We need places for terrorism. And uh, the first two blokes that they poured into there was uh, Baker and Crump. Yeah. Now, Baker and Crump were convicted of a really, really horrific murder, the, the Virginia Morse murder. And, of course... That sort of justified the existence of Katingle. Look, this is the type of people we're going to house in Katingle. Well, just on that, mm. um, it was Alan Banker and uh, Kevin Crump, um, rapists and murderers, mm. and uh, they were uh, um, the murder of uh, Virginia Morse and uh, another person, but they were described uh, by the uh, trial judge as uh, obscene animals. Yeah. Um, that was, that's a, yeah, that's a trial judge uh, you know, upon sentencing mm. them has described them as obscene animals. So mm. 
when the society's going, well, I we don't care what happens to exactly. people like that. And yeah, that exactly. was they, that was the first people that went they to were Cathedral. the first two that they transferred in they, and they had a, a big fanfare about it. This right. is the type of people we're going to put in there, blah, 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 yeah. blah. And on that subject, what a lot of people don't know mm-hmm. is Kevin Crump is also an ex-track. He was up in Grafton in 1970. Right. So that, this was before the Virginia Morse murder. This is another another, another one that's passed, passed yeah. through the system. Yeah. Yeah. Another statistic from Grafton that the prison department will never reveal. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Anyway... Going back to the story, they, they get them in, then then they start transferring us down. Freddie Harbeck was the first one transferred, then Earl Hootley and I was the third man transferred mm. into the place. And uh, then a whole new ball game started. Yeah. So with uh, Katingle, how how would you describe Katingle? Because I've been in Katingle after it was uh, shut down, but they were using it as a training uh, facility. But it looked like a spaceship. Um, yeah. To describe it, uh, if you could just describe your first impressions when you went to Katingle. So people that don't know Katingle, and probably should say this, it, it's like a jail within a jail. Yeah, it is. Um, you've described it as the um, Australia's first supermax. People would be aware of, you know, that's a fairly uh, cliche saying now, and, and we've got locations with supermax jails. But uh, Katingle was the first of its kind. Yes, that's right. And the whole idea was to make sure that the... Uh, Prisoners were, had no contact with the, uh, the the prison wardens. That's right. And uh, it was a new concept. That's right. But talking new concept, I remember walking in there and it looked like the set from um, um, Stan, Stanley Kubrick's um, Space Odyssey, yeah. 2001. It, yeah. was, uh, it was bizarre. Yeah. What was your first impression? My first impression? Well, well, okay, well I'll begin at the beginning. When they brought me down, we arrived down there of a night about six o'clock, it was dark, and the floodlights were on. It had a, con- it was a, it was like a concrete bunker, like an atomic bomb shelter mm. in the middle of the jail, and they had a cyclone fence around it. And the car pulled up, and there was a big shiny uh, gate uh, that, that, that lifted up. That was the car that allowed the cars to go in there. So they that opened up, and about eight or nine screws came out and of course they're all carrying buttons so I tensed up I'm expecting another reception biff because you know I don't know what to expect I'd have just been through graft and you know it's just a natural to, to expect that okay mm. I'm not going to cop another serve they drove the car in and then the, the door shut behind me then they got me out of the car I was dressed in the overalls and the slippers and the and the uh, the belt with with the handcuff shackle to it and I was frog marched through a grill door. And once I went through that grill door, I passed like a, a control booth. And there was, I could see screws in it. And then I went through another grill door. And then from that second grill door, I didn't know where I was. I didn't know whether I was above ground, below ground. I just I didn't have a clue. And they, they, they shepherded me along to a third grill door. And the grill door opened. And... They took me in, and you got to you got to understand. I've got about five or six screws standing around me, so I'm figuring you know, well, they're all getting all You're geared to up to, to to flog me. And we go through, we go past a little shower, and then they open up another grill door. Then there's there's a, a panel, a control panel, away from the from from the walkway, but behind steel grills, and a screws operating these controls from the panel. And the panel operates the doors opening and shutting. And they open up a cell door. It's all electronic. Everything's electronic. And I, they, they heard me into the cell. They said, right, I strip off. Well, as soon as they say strip off, I automatically go into defense mode. So I'm thinking, yeah, okay, this is when I'm going to cop it. So I, I'm all tensed up. I strip off. I'm waiting for them to pull out the buttons. And then the governor came in. The governor was a guy called McTaggart. And McTaggart comes in, she listen, Bernie, and that was the first thing that that, mm. that, that, that hit me, called me by my first name, because that had happened for five years. You know, I was always bastard, shithead, or whatever. He said, "Listen, Bernie," he said, "There's no biff here. There will be no floggings." And I looked at him for, yeah, yeah, good story, but I was all tensed up. And he said, "Look," he said, "I'm telling you the truth. You know, you're right. There, there won't be any floggings. There won't be any bashings. Just do what the officers tell you." So I stripped off. They gave me a dressing gown. And then they all filed out of the cell and they shut the cell door. And I looked around the cell and I had a concrete slab for a bed. 
I had a, 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 a toilet system that, that, that also had the drinking water fountain incorporated into it. And I had a hatch at the back of the cell. So I surveyed the cell, what it was, you know, what, it, you know, what I was going to live in. And I sat on the bed and this unbelievable, unbelievable sense of, I don't know what it was, just came over me because I was expecting a flogging. Mm. I didn't get it. And I go, what the fuck is going on here? I was just, I was in completely disorientated. Right, completely right. and gut, just completely gutted. You know, I, I'm I'm keyed up for this flog and I don't get it, and that was a bigger letdown. <laughs> if they had come in and flogged me, I, I, I could have accepted that. I wouldn't have liked it. Yeah, but I could have accepted it. Now it was just a big letdown. It, it sounds like it's uh, it was extremely disorientating to oh, yeah. to be taken into an environment from there. Look, I think we'll we'll stop at this stage. One, it, one point, yeah. I, I, I might might add in the Grab disorientation it. before you shut down. All the cell blocks, there was eight cell blocks. All of the cell blocks were colour-coded. Blue, upper blue, lower blue. Upper yellow, lower yellow. Upper red, lower red. Upper green, lower green. Now, the cell blocks were all colour-coded, not for our benefit, but they were colour-coded so the screws didn't get lost in the building. <laughs> that, uh, that says something about it, doesn't mm. it? And that, that's, that's your home and that's their working environment. That's right. But they, they couldn't get uh, disorientated. And they suffered just the same as we did. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk in detail. Uh, we'll have a break now, but when we come back for uh, part three of uh, I Catch Killers with our guest, uh, Bernie Matthews, we're going to discuss his time in Katingle. And uh, I think you'll be amazed by uh, his stories from Katingle. And uh, in fact, Bernie, I think you're the longest serving yeah. uh, prisoner yeah. in Katingle. Yeah, that's right. We'll have a break now and gather our thoughts. The violence inflicted is quite confronting. After my conversations with Bernie, I thought I would have a look at what was reported about Grafton Jail in the report of the Royal Commission in the New South Wales prisons in 1978, known as the Nagel Report. It makes interesting reading. In Chapter 7, dealing with the Grafton intractables, it states, In 1942 there was substantial upsurge in prisoner unrest in New South Wales, leading to a dramatic increase in breaches of prison discipline. There were several serious assaults on officers. As a result, permission was granted to use Grafton as a special institution for the treatment of recalcitrant and intractable prisoners. In a letter to the Under Secretary of Justice, dated the 17th of August 1943, the then Deputy Controller of Prisons said, it will be necessary for capable, tactful and robust officers to be selected to staff the institution and in view of the arduous nature of the duties which they will be required to undertake in maintaining discipline in a prison containing a large portion of dangerous criminals, I think it is reasonable that they should be granted additional remuneration. It became abundantly clear during the Commission's hearings that the arduous duties required of these officers largely consisted of inflicting brutal, savage and sometimes sadistic physical violence on the hapless group of intractables who were sent to Grafton. An officer made admissions before the commission that upon first admission to the jail, intractable prisoners were the subject of a reception biff, which consisted of physically beating of the prisoners about the back, buttocks, shoulders, legs and arms by two or three officers using rubber battens. Personally, as a police officer, I put plenty of people in jail. People who commit crimes need to be punished, especially those who commit violent crimes. I'm not a bleeding heart, but the type of violence described by Bernie serves no purpose and just should not have happened. There has to be a better way. If I was treated like that, I would come out a very angry human being. It should also be acknowledged that what occurred there was from a small group of officers. I don't think it's fair that every corrective service officer is judged by the actions of a few. When we get back to part three of our guest Bernie Matthews on I Catch Killers, we're going to discuss his time in Katingle. That's Australia's first supermax prison. It was closed down because of the inhumane way prisoners were treated at that facility. Not by the officers, but because of the mind-numbing environment they were kept in this so-called futuristic prison. Bernie is well placed to talk about Katingle. He's the longest serving prisoner from Katingle, a place that drove him to the edge, where he believed his only way out was to set his cell alight, actions that almost cost him his life and that of other prisoners. Make sure you join us for part three of Bernie Matthews on iCatch Killers.